right, guys. Hey, good morning to you. If you get your Bibles out, we're going to continue in the book of Ephesians today as we, uh, as we continue to march through this incredible letter from the Apostle Paul to the church of Ephesus. If you're guests with us today, man, welcome to Three Circle Church. You'll find out about us pretty fast that uh, one of the things we're all about is teaching the truth and unleashing the power of the truth of God's Word into our lives. So uh, we, we hold the Bible in very high regard here. It is our authority. It's the centerpiece of everything we do. We are scripture uh, authority here and, and Christ-centered and gospel-driven. That's, that's what we're all about. And I know many of you may be new and kind of moving to the area possibly and uh, you know, with school starting and all that good stuff. And I think you're going to find today that it's amazing how the timing of God's Word is so perfect because as our kids go back to school and as many of you kind of get back into your routines with work and all of that good stuff, you're going to find that the Bible is going to speak to you today. It's going to speak right at you, right where you are as we take a look at this. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're going to see, if you go to chapter 6, we're going to start chapter 6, is we're going to learn today how to be in authority and how to be under authority. Paul is going to teach us that, how to be in authority and how to be under authority, which is something that we all deal with. In fact, if you'd write this down, everyone is in authority and everyone is under authority, okay? Now you say, well, not me, man. I'm not really in any kind of authority. Well, if you're a mom or a dad, yes, you are. You have authority. Um, some of you are bosses and CEOs. Some of you are employees, but you have people that you lead, okay? So you are both under authority and uh, some of you are, or all of us are, in authority at some time. And in fact, let me tell you this, we all lead at least one person I know, and it's the person that looks at you in the mirror every day, okay? And just so you know, the hardest person for me to lead is the dude I look at in the mirror every day. That guy, when I'm brushing my teeth, that's staring back at me, that guy is hard to deal with, okay? Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, the hardest person for me to lead is Chris Bell, and I have to lead this guy. i got to lead me. So we all have this element of authority, both in it and under it, and we're going to learn what the Bible would teach us about that. So we go to Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, and Paul is going to begin in our homes. Remember, Paul has taught us lots of theology, lots of doctrine. He has taught us what it means to find your identity in Christ. He has taught us what it means to be a believer and to be transformed by the gospel and all that God has done for us. And now in this second half, he's teaching us how to live. Here's how you live now that you have been transformed by Jesus. And he begins in our homes, and he begins with kids, he begins with children. And he says this in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Okay, quoting straight from the Ten Commandments. So what we see here is we see that Paul starts in our homes, he starts with kids, but since kids are kids, they have to be taught, right? What this is really talking to is parents. Really this is saying, hey parents, here is what you're supposed to be doing in your homes. This is something you're supposed to be doing. What am I supposed to do as a parent? I don't know if you remember that overwhelming feeling when you brought your first child home. I remember you're kind of looking at it going, what do I, what do, I do with this thing now? What, what do I do, right? Okay, the Bible says that one thing that we're to do, and if you want to write it down, a parent's what is what we're going to call it. What do I do? What, what you do is you teach children to honor and obey according to this. Honor and obey. As unto the Lord, which means God designed it to where parents would teach their kids to honor and obey them, ultimately teaching them how to honor and obey the Lord. Does that make sense? So that is the path that we're on, okay? That's what's supposed to be happening in your home. Now we're going to look at how that's supposed to happen in just a minute, but that is the what. The what is you've got to teach your kids to obey and honor. Now, let's be honest for a minute. Is there anything more annoying and frustrating than being around parents who will not discipline their kids? Do you know what I'm talking about? And typically they're clueless. They don't know. They don't know. They think you're, you just think their kid's cute and, and, and you're wanting to do something, you know what I mean, about it. Have you ever been with people where you prayed internally and quietly for God to suddenly give you the power to discipline that child? <laughs> you ever had that happen? All right. You know it. There's nothing worse. Okay? And some of you parents in here, let me tell you, if you're the parent that won't discipline your kid and you're always saying things like, well, he's just a handful and that kind of stuff, just know the reason your, your friends aren't inviting you over for dinner anymore is not because they're busy. Okay? They're telling you that. That's not why. They don't want your kids around, all right? Because there's nothing worse than being around people that will not do this, that will not discipline their kid. The Bible says if you don't discipline your child, you don't really love them. So the Scripture teaches that you're doing them a disservice 
Okay, so that is first. I want to grab onto that, okay? But I want you to notice some things here. The Bible does not say to only teach your kid to be obedient. It says to teach your kid to honor as well. Now, there's a difference, and, and I want to show you what it means. Honor is talking about attitude. Honor is internal. It is a posture. It is teaching your kid what they need to think about you, so to speak. And then obey means action. Now, here's what I think happens a lot in our parenting is we focus on the action. So many of us, our parenting takes on the complexion of simply getting our kid to do what we tell them to do. If that's all you do, then you are only half parenting. Let me say that again. This is very practical today. If you only get your kids to do what you tell them to do and you don't capture their hearts, then you are half parenting. Okay? And let me tell you what that ends up doing. Because we know statistically what happens is parents who simply spend 18 years teaching their kids and making their kids to do what they tell them to do but never capture their heart, never make the connection, never actually teach, they simply get behavior modification. What happens when they're 18 is they leave the home and they also leave all the things that their parents made them do. Okay? They stop going to church and they leave it all. Anything. Because their parent never captured their heart. They just... And, and here's the deal. Parents, when you're in authority over a child... You have, the, you have the ability to make life miserable on that kid. You can make a kid do what you want them to do. You can. And some of you are falling in that ditch. Your parenting is just, I'm, they're going to do what I tell them to do. And by the way, in the South, in the South, we, we're kind of proud of our discipline, aren't we, in the South? Like we make fun of our friends in other places in the country, like time out. We just, ha, 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 time out, right? We just laugh. Well, I got time out, time out to go get my belt, right? That's how we are in the South. Yeah. Okay. Some of y'all just moved here from like Ohio and you're going, oh my Lord, <laughs> what are these people's problems? Uh, we do love our kids, but that's some, and see, if you're not careful, that'll be, listen, you can spank your kid into submission and not get your kid's heart. Do you know that? You can shout your kid down and get your kid to do what you want them to do. You do that for 18 years, they're going to walk out of your house and they're going to go do something completely different than what you've taught them because you never captured their hearts. You were a domineering ruler instead of a loving parent. Okay, So you can fall on both sides of the ditch. And that's why the Bible teaches both. We are to capture our kids' hearts. That means i got to do more than just put them in time out or just spank or whatever your deal is. And, and to get them to do what I want them to do, I have to have the conversation. I have to talk about why I'm teaching them to do this. i got to talk to them about why it's important. And as I do that, the model is that I would also be teaching my kid how to honor and follow and obey Jesus. Does that make sense? That's what's supposed to be happening in our homes. That's a lot more work. It's a lot more work, okay? Uh, the Bible teaches us not just the adherence, it also teaches us grabbing the heart. In fact, the next verse, verse 4, begins to teach us, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And this, is a, this is an awesome, awesome verse here for us to grab onto. This word fathers is actually the, the, the word here, the Greek word, and then even if you go to its derivative in the Hebrew, this word does not just mean fathers. So all you moms, you've been reading this verse, and you said, well, the dad can't frustrate them, but I sure can, right? Uh, no, this actual word means parents, okay? And, and trust me, I'm not trying to be uh, gender neutral here. I don't roll that way at all. So I would not tell you this if it wasn't a biblical thing. There's an instance in the Bible where the same word is used to describe both of Moses' parents. So in this context, clearly it's talking about parenting. And so I, we could easily say moms and dads do not provoke your kid to anger. So the what of parenting is you've got to teach your kid to obey and honor, grab their heart and their actions, but... Here's how, and it's one word, it's grace. How do we parent? Grace. Because that's how you're parented by your Heavenly Father, right? How many of you, God has forgiven you of things that you went right out and did it again, and He forgave you again and again and again? How many of you, that's happened in your life? Two people, two people in here, God is good. <laughs> Tough crowd, All right? So let's grab on to that for a second. How does God parent you? That is how, your kids need to begin to see that. Now let me be honest with you. I do not always reflect my Heavenly Father in the way I parent. I'm diminished. I am broken. Okay, I don't always get it right. But I think we all need to see the needle moving. And let me just ask you, as, as you step back into a parenting season, so to speak, okay, what's going to change about how you parent? 
or are you just going to keep doing it like you are? And trust me, the window's closing, guys. Every year that goes by, every start of school, you're losing one more year, one more month, one more moment to be the parent God has called you to be. And the most important job you have is to parent your kids. Right? So, what's going to change? And the Bible tells us that it should be filled with with grace. It says, don't provoke your children to anger. The idea here is, is that you would place demands on your kids that are unattainable, that would lead them to, first of all, to just give up, make the kid just want to give up. How many of you encourage your kids, or do you just always tell them what they're doing wrong? Where do you fall? Is there balance? Sometimes you got to tell your kid they're doing wrong. I get that. But do you also encourage them? Do you speak to their hearts? Do you speak to the kid's future? Do you speak to the good things you see in that child and what you believe God's doing in their lives? Because that, that would be part of it. Nothing worse than frustrating a kid. I'll tell you one, one thing that frustrates me and my kids. My, we like to go to the arcade sometimes, and my kids love this machine, the claw machine. You ever seen the claw machine where you, you grab stuff? I, I hate that machine. I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't like that machine. For one thing, it's like 10 bucks, right? A, a shot. You're going, are you kidding me? We're at like quarter. No, not quarter anymore. Dollars to play the game. And there's always iPads and iPods and all kinds of stuff right in the bottom. But what I know, and my kids are starting to learn, but what I know is that claw's never going to pick any of that stuff up. Don't you all know that? Right? Let me tell you how it works. Let's just say this is the iPod, the iPod that they want, okay? My kid walks up, Daddy, I really, I think I can do it. And I'm going, no, you can't, but okay. I pull out my $5, all right, stick it in there, whatever it is, and my kid goes after the iPod. And here's how it goes. Right? And, and, and he's trying to get, and he gets it right over it. And he's excited. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. And he hits the button, right? And here it comes. Gets down on it. And, and don't you, you've all seen this happen, right? Here's what it does. Just kind of. <laughs> And at that point, I want to destroy the machine, right? And then my kid hits the button, and it kind of does this. Up to the top, all right? Rigged. The thing is rigged. And I get frustrated, and my middle son, Cooper, he has physically assaulted the machine before. He's like, no! You know? Frustration. You see it on their face. Let me ask you something. How many of you have ever seen that look on your kid's face because of your parenting? Have you? I have. I frustrated my kids before. That look on their face that says, Daddy, I don't think I can ever get this good enough for you. Right? Daddy, I don't think I can jump the hoop that you're wanting me to jump. And I'm frustrated because I've tried to do I've been there. And man, you feel horrible about it. But, but the only thing you can do is correct it. And I would just say to you, the Bible says that it's sinful for a parent to parent in a way that provokes a child to anger, which means you've got to parent in a way that that kid feels like they can meet your demands, they can meet your goals, and they see Jesus in you. And Jesus was full of a lot of truth. Jesus told people, don't sin anymore. Jesus made a whip out of out a rope one time, ran everyone out of the temple. So don't put a choir behind Jesus all the time, okay? Because it wasn't always choir singing. Sometimes Sometimes it was Jesus getting down to business. And some of you need to do that. Some, some of you parents in this room, you need to stop letting your kid be the CEO of your house. You need to be the boss of your house. And some of you don't want to admit it, but your kid is the boss. You do what your kid wants. The rhythm of your house is built on what your kid's emotions are and what they want. Everything's built around the kids. You need to reintroduce yourself to your spouse because you haven't done anything with them in two years. It's all about the kids. Okay, that is not good. But what's also not good is for you to treat your kid like they're just some being living in your house that you can order around, tell them what to do, and never speak into their heart and their life. That would need to change as well. Are y'all with me, Three Circle? That's the kind of parenting we need, and the Bible warns us about this. So a parent's house is grace, because God is truthful, but He's also forgiving, and he's also, He also doesn't hold a record of wrongs. How many of you like to throw the whole book at your kid when they mess up? You ever done that? It's like, yeah, yeah, well, remember last week you didn't clean up your room, you didn't the week before that, you haven't cleaned up your room in four years, you know, that kind of thing. That's keeping a record of wrong, man. We've got, we have to begin to model Jesus to our kids. Write this down if you would. A parent's authority and a child's obedience are both tied to Jesus. The Bible keeps tying it back to Jesus. 
Why should, as a child, if you're a kid in this room, or why should you teach your kids to obey you? Because Jesus taught us to obey Him. He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Okay? But Jesus always wanted our hearts. So, we are tied back to Jesus. The reason I should parent with grace is because I am being parented by grace by my Father. That's why I do it. It's all tied back to the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. So we have gospel-driven parenting. We have gospel-driven parenting. Okay, let me say this to us. Some of us are parenting on a model that was given to us by our parents or our grandparents. That's just how we parent. Well, that's just how we do it. That's how the bells do it. It's just how we roll. And let me just say, your model, even if you had great parents, needs to be Jesus. You need to go to the Bible for your parenting. If not, you will repeat the same mistakes that you grew up with, okay? And we're all going to make them. Go to Jesus, go to the Gospels, go to the Bible for the authority and how you parent. Let me say this to some of you guys. Listen, this is an epidemic sometimes in the South especially. If you're one of those guys and you go, look, I just don't, I love my kids, but I don't, I don't ever tell them and I don't show any affection and all that kind of stuff. And the reason I don't is my dad didn't show me and, and his granddad and, you know, his dad didn't show him and on and on and on. Let me just say, stop the cycle now. Do not be that classic southern oak tree stoic dad that's so proud that you can make your kid do what they're supposed to do because they're so scared of you, but they don't know what it's like to have you look them in the eye and tell them that you love them, you care for them, they can get in your arms, they can get in your lap, and they know their dad cares for them. Okay, you got to model that for your kids. you got to. So if you go, well, no one taught me, then learn. Learn how to do it. Learn from your Heavenly Father, okay, how to do that. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. And, and, and be the parent that God has called you to be. And, and that parent is full of both truth and grace. Not passive, also not, what would I say, too strong, too aggressive. No, there's a balance. And we see that in the model that Jesus gave us. And then ultimately what we see here is it says we should teach them, verse 4, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is huge. And let me just say this. As school starts to all of us today, parents have a responsibility to lead their children to follow Jesus. Let that soak in. Because if you're not careful, you will fall right into our culture that your main job is to make sure your kids have lots of activities. Or your main job is to make sure your kid is successful. Or that your kid is popular. Or that your kid um, is the best baseball player, soccer player, right? And there's all kinds of pressure out there. Trust me, I'm living in that world. Well, if your kid's going to be good, he's got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that. And I, and I look at some families and I'm like, I don't know how, how y'all are even a family because it seems like you go from one thing to another literally year round. It's constant activity, constant Okay, and I, I'm not trying to beat anyone up here. I'm just saying, evaluate. Just step back and evaluate what's going on in your home and going on with your families because your main job with your kids is to lead them to follow Jesus. Listen, if you raise an NFL-caliber football player and he doesn't know Jesus, you have failed. Okay? If you raise kids that, that grow up to make lots of money and have big houses and, and nice cars and all that stuff and they walk away from Jesus... And, they, and you didn't teach them to, to follow Jesus. Man, then what were we doing? What were we doing all those years when they were in our homes? Okay? So I just want to bring us back to that idea. We are to teach our kids to follow Jesus. That is the goal of Christian parenting. That means, let me ask you this. How much are you going to prioritize that in your home? Are you guys going to, and, and this is something I wrestle with, okay? Are, is the Word of God going to become a part of your routine in your house? Along with everything else, are you going to spend some time in the Word of God? Are you going to lead your family? Are you going to talk about Jesus? When's that going to happen? By the way, you have 24 hours to get your act together, okay? It's great that we're talking about this because you could start tomorrow. Human nature will say that if you wait a couple of months and don't do it, you'll go, well, we'll just have to do it next year because we've we're already blown this year. So I would say start now. Like tomorrow, get up. And even if it's one verse, get your family together in the kitchen while they're all down in their Apple Jacks or whatever. And you say, hey, while y'all are eating, Daddy's going to read you a verse. Dad's a lead out in this. Lead out. Don't, let mom, don't make Mom go do it. You get up and go find a scripture and read it to everybody and pray with them. It takes just that long, and you're beginning to 
inject into your family leadership, thinking about Jesus, okay? The Word of God, hey, when you're eating together, and do that as much as you can, by the way, do that as much as you can, talk about Jesus, talk about the gospel, talk about what God's doing in your life. It'll be a little awkward for a while. Your, your kids are going to, they're not all going to go, oh, Father, I am so happy to read the Bible. Let's talk about the Lord. No, that's not going to happen. They're going to roll their eyes at you. Sometimes they're going to go, oh, Dad, right? You know what? Just stick it to them, man. Just keep reading, right? Just read a little louder. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You can preach a little bit in the kitchen, all right? Lead out, man. Okay? When we do family devotions, it's like monkeys in my house. Man, kids climbing all over the couch and stuff. It's great. So don't think it's perfect, okay? Do it, though, and, and, make, and be consistent. Be consistent and watch what happens in your home because our jobs are to lead our kids to follow Jesus. Let me just, one, one last thing before we leave this. The Apostle Paul was writing this into a culture where children, we've already talked about women and how the culture demeaned women and the Gospels and the Apostles lifted up women. Now we see kids. Children were not looked at as very valuable in these cultures. They were property, basically. And sometimes they were just in the way, okay? Uh, Paul writes into a culture like that, and he says, hey, parents, your kids are not just property. They're not just add-ons to your home. They're not just something for you to make work around your house. They are real people with real dignity, and you're to love them and display the love of Christ in the way you parent. That's what Paul did. He raised up kids. By the way, Jesus was pretty serious about kids. He got a little violent with it. You remember? He said one time, hey, if any of you hurt one of these kids, it'd be better for you to have a big rock tied around your head and thrown into the ocean. <laughs> Whoa. Just so you know, Jesus wasn't always sweet and nice and cuddly, okay? Jesus told the truth. One time, his disciples didn't even get how much he loved children, and the kids were trying to come to him, and the, disciple, the disciples were trying to get the kids away, and he said, hey, hey, whoa, whoa. Don't ever stop a kid from coming to me. And he said, oh, by the way, if all of you don't get, a, get to be a little more like these kids, you're not going to go to heaven. It's amazing the value that we're giving to children. So I think that if the Apostle Paul could stand in pulpits in America today, you know what I think he'd say? I think if he could get on a news channel, if he could get on a blog, I think he would say, hey, United States of America, children are to be protected, they're to be dignified, they are a blessing so stop taking their lives while they're still in their mother's womb, tearing them apart and selling their body parts for profit. Instead, dignify their lives. I think that's what the Apostle Paul would say. Just a hunch. I think he would say that to our society. Okay, and so I'm going to say it today. That children are a blessing. They're a blessing. Right now, there's a bunch of them all over this campus. Okay? My little girl moved up today. She's now in big kids church so excited mm. my baby's growing up but when I went in there and I looked and I'm here in worship and people talking about Jesus and I just think wow what a, what a great place to have a kid right so they hear about Jesus now Paul switches gears and now he's going to talk about working and employees and that kind of thing and this is going to be very practical for all of us because we all deal with this let's dive right in Paul says in verse 5 bond servants obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So now Paul gets even more practical, and he's talking about when you're in authority and when you're under authority, and he starts off with people under authority. He starts off with the idea of bond servants, which really was a form of slavery in the uh, New Testament times, okay? Very different than what we know from historical American antebellum South uh, slavery, which, by the way, is a horrific blight and scar on the history of the United States, including our region. Thank God that we don't have that anymore. And one of the great scars to Christianity in the American South is that 
for a hundred years, preachers and pastors and churches and Christians twisted the Word of God to justify one of the most horrific and disgusting practices that has ever been practiced on human soil, okay? And that'd be slavery. So we're glad that's over, all right? But slavery in the New Testament, and it's why many of your translations don't use the word slavery, it uses the word bondservant, is because that's really what it was. You would have someone, because they didn't have bankruptcy and things like that back then, if you owed a debt, you could go to prison the rest of your life because you didn't pay it. So they, would, they did bond servants. If I owed money and I couldn't pay it, I would work for that person. I would come into bond servanthood with that person to pay off my debt. This would also be a way that children who were just thrown out in the streets, since these were cultures that didn't value kids, sometimes they'd just be thrown out in the streets. Well, people would take them in, and they would become bond servants. They would work, okay? But the, the kind of the positive side of the way it worked in New Testament times is often these kids and these people would be trained in a craft and a trade, and it would actually work to their benefit. They were taken care of, they were fed, they were given shelter, and then when they were 25, 30 years old, they would come out from under that bond servanthood, and often they would even continue to work for their previous masters. We see in the writings of Paul that Paul was against slavery. He even said to slaves in some of his writing, when you can, get out from under that situation. This isn't God's intention for human beings, okay? But here's what I want you to see here. I want you to write this down. Paul was teaching in Ephesians how to follow Jesus in your social structure rather than commenting on those social structures. So if you wonder, why didn't Paul say he was against slavery? Well, because his job wasn't to comment on the society. He also didn't talk about belligerent empires and emperors and all that. What he was doing was telling Christians how to live in whatever circumstance they found themselves in. Does that make sense? So he's teaching, hey, if you're an employee or a boss, how does the gospel now change how you do things? If you work for someone or if you own the company, how does the gospel change? If you're a child or a parent, how does the gospel inform how you do things? Okay, and the big idea here is that now that you're a Christian, you should do, watch this, you should do everything you do like you're doing it for God. That's the new idea. That's a paradigm shift. No one had ever taught this before. Everything I do now, I do it for the glory of God. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily, from your heart, right, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So now as a Christian, I can't watch this. I can't just work and go to my job like I used to anymore. I can't work, like he said, don't do it for eye service. Don't wait till your boss is around and work really hard and act like you like your boss, and then when he walks off, you start getting lazy and you do just enough to get by and you talk bad about your boss. And some of you are going, oh my gosh, I do that all the time, <laughs> right? Okay, the Bible says the gospel changes that. Because now, watch this, as a Christian, I realize that everything I do now represents Jesus and can be done for His glory. I can redeem everything in my life for the glory of God. Get this now, this is awesome because what Paul's doing is he's bringing great dignity and purpose to all of the work that we do. So that means now if you're the janitor or the CEO, you can redeem the work you do for the glory of God. That means if you're changing diapers or if you're doing surgeries, if you're teaching a classroom or if you're cleaning floors, everything you do is sacred and dignified because of the gospel. That is awesome. Because some of you go to jobs, frankly, that you hate. Like tomorrow morning, you're not going to wake up going, I am so excited. Some of you wake up and go, man, i got to go to work again today. And many of us think that that's normal. Now watch this. The gospel is so invasive. It is so invasive that it leaks down into even that area of your life to where it begins to change how you see your employer, how you see your coworkers, and how you see the work you do. You begin to take joy in it, you begin to see the dignity in it, and it changes you. Do you see how this works? Did you know that work is a gift, by the way? See, many of us erroneously believe that work is a result of the fall. Many people think work is part of the curse. Some of you are those people, you, you're just praying for God to let you win the lottery so you never have to work again, okay? Work is a gift. Did you know that Adam had a job before he got a wife? I like that order, don't you? I think we should probably bring that back, right? <laughs> I'm telling you right now, if some dude comes and asks me to marry Gracie one day and they don't have a job, we'll be like, <laughs> my best Sean Connery laugh as I tell him how to get out of the driveway, okay? Right, so Adam 
before the fall, had work. What's the first thing you see God doing in the Bible, by the way? First thing God does is he works. And then he is proud of his work. And then he makes man in his image, and man gets to work, okay? So work is a part of what we do. We're not supposed to not do anything. It's why men who, who, who lose their job sometimes get depressed really fast. Why? They're designed to do something, okay? So don't ever look at work the same way again. Paul forever has dignified work here, and it doesn't matter what you do. You do it for the glory of God because you now don't, you don't just represent you or your company. You represent Jesus. And everything you do, God is watching, by the way. So we, we'll say this. Christians are to do everything we do like we're doing it for God. And there is great beauty and honor and purpose involved in working with integrity. Work with integrity is a beautiful thing. And it doesn't matter what that work is when it's done with integrity. What does integrity mean? It means the same thing that teaching your kid to obey and honor means. It means you don't just do your job, you do it with a good attitude and a good heart. That's the difference. Because God always wants your heart, not just your behavior. Be honest now. How many of you have ever done a job? You did exactly what your employer told you to do, but you hated every minute of it, you griped about it while you did it, and in your mind you thought that your boss was stupid, and you may have even told a few people quietly that that was the case. Can we just be honest in the room? So maybe you have to be careful your boss may be sitting in here. Okay, I totally understand that. But we do have cameras, and we're going to take some still shots and put that on Facebook. It's going to be great. I think we're all guilty of this, right? The gospel is supposed to change everything about us. Everything including this area. And by the way, this is an area that we all deal with. Some of you are stay-at-home moms, and you think, I am wasting my life, right? Sometimes you get up and you go, another day while my husband gets to go to work, and he's going to his little lunches and all with everybody, right? The last thing you want to hear is when your husband calls, say, guess where I'm going to lunch? You just want to take the phone and throw it at him, right? I know because I called the man and told him where I was at lunch. <laughs> It didn't uh, go so well. So, stay-at-home moms, your job is, is full of great dignity. And you do what you do to the glory of God. And he, by the way, write it down, he sees all and will reward all. God sees everything you're doing. And according to him, he will reward you, both in this life and the life to come. He will reward you, even if you don't get rewarded on this side of it. Because the, the immediate answer to this would be, well, What's the big deal? If I, if I do just enough to get by, I'm going to get paid the same as the other guys, whether I work harder or I do just enough to get by, we're all getting paid the same. That's the attitude of someone who has not been transformed by the gospel. Okay? Because now I don't work for my boss or my company. I work for Jesus. I do everything I do for Jesus. And by the way, when people of God begin to work like this and do life like this, we begin to have great leverage and great credibility for the gospel why do you think god wants you to work harder than everyone else maybe because you have an opportunity to lead your co-workers and your boss to jesus but if you're just like everyone else you will not have that leverage because they'll go well, there's nothing different about you but just maybe if you live this kind of life this radical following of jesus even in the workplace you may have some opportunities you would not have otherwise well, let me say this, because he doesn't just talk to people under authority, employees. He talks to masters. Verse 9, masters, stop your threatening. And I love this. He says, and remember, when you're the boss, you better remember that your master in heaven is also the master in heaven to your employees. You're both serving the same master. So a Christian boss has to be a leader and a boss in a totally different way. Okay? And let me just say this. Few things show a person's character more than when they're in authority. I planted a church in Florida in a movie theater. And uh, that movie theater was in a mall, and they had two mall cops at the mall. One of those mall cops was great, helped us out, very kind. She did not see her mall cop badge and her pepper spray can as things to uh, hold over people. She just wanted to help. We had another mall cop, though, at the mall, who... Evidently, when he was given his pepper can spray and his mall cop badge, he transformed into Rambo, okay? 
He was now Sylvester Stallone. Hey, what are you doing? You know, that's, that, that was him. And it was unbelievable how hard he made it on us. I mean, it was horrible. And he strutted around that mall. All right, sometimes he'd have his pepper spray out, just kind of kind of like this, you know. <laughs> it was unbelievable. He drove us crazy. He abused his authority. He was given this much authority and acted like he had this much. He did not know how to be in authority. How many of you have ever seen someone who was given a little bit of power, a little bit of authority, and oh my goodness. I talk to pastors. I'm so grateful for the way we do things at Three Circle. But I know guys that are at churches that have guys that are on their deacon boards and stuff like that don't have a clue how to lead a church but will tell a guy who's been leading the church for 25 years everything he needs to do to lead the church and how they know everything that he needs to do. That's why, by the way, if you ever wonder why a lot of churches don't grow and don't get a lot done, there it is, right there. Some of you came out of churches like that, okay, where you had people that didn't know anything about running a church, running the church. <laughs> it's always a bad thing because you give people a little bit of authority, they will run with it, okay? The Bible says we as Christians, that has to be different, okay? So I would ask you this. How are you when you're the most important person in the room? Because we all have those moments. When you're the most powerful person in the room, is it good for everybody else? Or is it just good for you? That, that's true of your kids. It's true of your home. Right? That's true of those of you who are bosses, those of you who lead. When you're the most powerful person in the room, do you leverage that to the benefit of others, or do you always leverage it for your own benefit? And I would just say this to all of us. When you're the boss, be like Jesus. Because Jesus, by the way, has never been in a room ever when he wasn't the most important person in the room. Would you agree with that? Jesus was always in control. Do you remember when Pilate... Pilate, historically, is known to have been so intimidating that when people would bring him water they would shake so violently because they were so afraid of what he might do to them at a whim that, that literally the, the, the pieces of metal and, and the things that they were bringing his food and his drinks on would literally clang together because they would shake. They were so afraid of Pilate. Pilate was vicious. Pontius Pilate. The man who Jesus stood in front of. Yet Jesus stood in front of him and had a conversation with him. Talked to him kindly. Respected him. But there came a moment where Pilate threatened Jesus. Do you remember this? And he said, do you not know that I have the power to crucify you? And Jesus looked at the most vicious man on the planet, eyeball to eyeball, what is your... beaten beyond the recognition of a man, bleeding to death, barely able to breathe and stand there, looked at him and said, you have no authority over me. Jesus was always in control. He said, you have, no, you have no authority right now. If I wanted to, I could snap my fingers and all of heaven would be on you and your empire and you'd be on your knees. Just like that. Jesus never walked into a room where he wasn't the most important one, yet every room he ever walked into, it was good for everyone else in there. One night, emphatically, with his disciples, he got up from a supper, took off his robe, put a towel around him, and went one by one on his knees and washed their feet. That's how you lead. You want to be a boss? You want to be a leader? Serve. Like Jesus. Wash feet. Love people. Serve people. Make sure that when you're the most important person in the room, it's good for everyone else in the room. That's how to be like Jesus. The big question we have to ask is, who are we, who are we trying to impress? Who are we trying to fear here who do we fear and, and proverbs reminds us the fear of man is always a trap if you're worried about impressing your boss or impressing this person or parenting like your mom and dad want you to parent or all that stuff you will fall into a trap but when you trust the lord proverbs says you're going to find good ground to stand on in every arena of your life and here's what i want to do now we have something we want you to see that hopefully will just inspire you to both parent and work like you're doing it for jesus all right check this out What is your work? How do you spend your days? What are you making? What are you getting done? What do you accomplish with your hours? What is your work? For those in Christ, there are better questions. 
Who do you worship in the work that you do? Who are you serving in your labor? Whose glory drives your effort? How does how you do your work reveal the character of God? Will tomorrow be measured in dollars and hours and completed tasks? Or will the day be counted in eternity as one spent in service to the King? In the name of Jesus, we will strive for excellence. We will build with integrity. We will create order and beauty. And whatever we do with our hands, our hearts will declare, I am a living sacrifice. This is my offering to you. That is our work. So we end today with this thought, every Christian ultimately works for Jesus. So here's what we're going to do to respond to this truth today. I mean, we are praying for all of you teachers, all of you children, all you parents. But this fall, let's parent like Jesus and let's work in our jobs like Jesus, all right? Pastor Zach is going to lead us in a song to respond to the Lord. And as we sing, pray, spend some time with the Lord. What are you going to commit to? What's going to change? What are you going to do now because of the truth you've heard? How, how's your parenting going to change? How's your work going to change? Ask God to help you with this because you can't do it alone. You need His help, okay? Let's respond to the Lord now.